than three months since we last sat in a meeting together. Uh, gone are the days of Bermuda shorts and slippers. We're now back into proper attire. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Councillor Matthew Hall, and I'm Chairman of Dorset Council's Audit and Governance Committee. Uh, members of the committee, I'll go round for you to introduce yourselves. Um, if you could just give us a, a quick hello and where you are from. So first of all, over to Susan. Good morning, everyone. My name's Councillor Susan Cockin. I represent Portland Town Council, Portland, and I'm also on Dorset Council. Thank you, Susan. Barry? Morning, everybody. I'm Councillor Barry Gray, and I'm from Prince Charles Ward. Mike? Uh, morning, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Mike Parks, uh, Ferndown North. Rod? Morning, Chair. Rod Adkins, Ferndown South. Richard? Good morning, Richard Biggs, representing Poundbury, Dorchester, and Vice Chairman. Lastly, Bill. Thank you. My apologies for slight lateness. Uh, Councillor Bill Tripe represents Swanage. Morning, everybody. As I said prior to the meeting, can all officers just give a brief introduction the first time they speak, please? Um, we'll get on to the agenda now. Agenda item number one is apologies. Have we received any? Thank you. We have one apology from Councillor Janet Dover. Thank you. Agenda item two is the minutes. To confirm the minutes of the meetings held on the 19th of April, 21st of June, 9th of July, 21st of September, 15th of November 2021, and the 17th of January 2022. They're all here for me to sign, which I shall do in length afterwards. Do I have a proposer for those? Uh, Mike, proposing? Rod, all those in favour? Thank you, that's everybody. Agenda item number three, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations to give? No, thank you very much. Agenda item four is public participation, which I believe there isn't any. So we go on to the main part of today's um, agenda, which is agenda item number five, which is the internal audit annual opinion report for 2021-22. Uh, the report is being presented by Sally White from SWAP. Over to you, Sally. Thank you, Chair. Sally White, Assistant Director, Swap Internal Audit Services. This is the annual opinion report and is a report that we're required to produce uh, once a year, which provides the Audit Committee with an opinion on the adequacy and effectiveness of Dorset Council's uh, governance, risk and control processes. The At A Glance page highlights the key things to draw from the report. The report covers the 21-22 financial year, and as you can see, we've provided a reasonable opinion, but highlighted that there have been some limits to the breadth of our work. This has mainly been uh, due to demand-driven COVID grant certifications, and to a much lesser extent, some limited staff redeployment at the start of the year. Additionally, it's very positive to report that there have been no significant corporate risks identified during the year. Over the past 12 months, you will be aware that we have been developing a process of continuous follow-up to confirm implementation of agreed management actions. We have directorate key contacts who work with managers to obtain updates and ensure that we are able to sign off actions once they are implemented. We have made uh, significant progress this year, although we do have a few long outstanding actions that we are working to clear. We understand that Dorset Council's senior leadership team have requested an additional performance measure of the number of days that a, an action is overdue, and therefore we are hoping that this will help to reduce the number of long outstanding actions. This new process of follow-up has delivered efficiencies. This then frees up the team to undertake more direct audit work. Moving on to the added value pages of the report, one of the key things to highlight is that as part of our work this year, we've identified cash savings to the council amounting to £127,000. Much of this has been through encouraging further eligible expenditure that's been allocated to COVID grant claims wherever possible, thus avoiding the need to return this unused funding to central government. 
We've also made some valuable progress in helping to facilitate the data matching work using the CIFAS database. And SWAP has paid the Council's annual subscription of around £8,450 for this. There is some anecdotal evidence that use of the system is now acting as a deterrent to fraud within the insurance team, which is extremely positive. That's all I wanted to sort of specifically draw your attention to, but happy to take any questions or comments on this paper. Thank you, Sally. And um, before I open up the floor to questions from members, Aidan, as member of the senior leadership team, I don't know if you wanted to make any comments with regards to the report. Thank you. Good morning, committee. Aidan Dunn, I'm the uh, executive director for corporate development. Yeah, as a senior leadership team, we uh, went through this report uh, two or three weeks ago uh, and uh, fully sort of recognize and endorse it. I think the uh, point that Sally makes about the implementation of the audit actions is particularly uh, important. And you can see from the, the charts that there is a continuous improvement there. We brought it under greater spotlight. I think we can still do better as a senior leadership team. We can always do better, um, but the direction of travel is really uh, positive. So uh, generally uh, supportive of this report. Thank you. Thank you, Aidan. Um, over to questions from members. Do I have any questions? Richard. Yes, I think it is generally all very, very good. Um, but obviously, I think it's right that we we look at areas that are perhaps not so good, and there's just a few of those. Um, I'm looking at perhaps page 49, um, and I don't quite understand the uh, service user financial contributions. I wonder if you could give me a bit more explanation about what that means and what, what the implications are. Thank you. Sorry, just to clarify, um, Councillor, are you um, sort of asking about the um, the medium limited assurance that was given to the service user financial contributions? Yes, I am ready, and also a bit. I think that it won't mean much to, to members of the public. It doesn't mean a lot to me that I'm in the description either. Thank you. Sorry, service user uh, financial contributions is. Um, for um, service users of adult services who need to make contributions to uh, their, the services that they receive. Um, <coughs> the audit um, covered um, the, the process of um, assessing those service users. Any other questions from members? Aidan, you wanted to come back? Uh, thank you. If I, could I just put a little flag in that uh, topic, the service user financial contributions, because this is going to be a really hot topic for us, for, for local government as a, as a whole, as the um, charging reforms go through um, uh, starting in October next year, October 23. And you know, I think your members will be aware that there's going to be a price cap and the capital threshold is going to change. This is, um, it's got real, this could cost Dorset Council a lot of money in terms of the impact of these service reforms. So I think uh, understanding how service user financial contributions links in is, is really important. And this is a, a hot topic that you may wish to return to when we come and look at the forward plan. Yeah, I was just about to come back on that and say, if your assessment is right, and I have no reason to doubt that, is that something that we should, as a audit committee, be keeping a regular um, look as to what is going and how it's affecting? Or are you suggesting that that only needs to be done sort of twice a year or something like that? What's, what's your summing up? Uh, uh, so, and, and I'll need to take guidance from Jonathan perhaps here on whether this is a scrutiny issue or an audit committee issue, but I would, I would suggest that the impact of the adult, adult social care financial reforms is the biggest financial risk to this authority. So either through audit or scrutiny, I'd suggest that we need to keep a regular eye on or a regular review 
of the impact of those reforms, how we're preparing for them, and then post-implementation from October next year. But certainly the highest risk to the financial risk to this organization as I see it at the moment. Jonathan, so in your legal, are we looking at us or are we looking at scrutiny for that? Yeah, good morning, members. Um, Jonathan Mayor, I'm the monitoring officer. Um, so I think, Chairman, this is a matter more for the uh, P People and Health uh, Scrutiny Committee to be looking at. Um, otherwise, your committees could end up getting involved in, in the detail of all of the risks uh, that this authority faces. Uh, Aidan has explained this is the, the, biggest, signif uh, the biggest single financial risk um, to, that the authority faces. Um, and I think it's right that the scrutiny committee should therefore be getting in, into that. Uh, but obviously your committee has a role in making sure that they are, they are doing that, that the risk is recognized and that it's being dealt with in the appropriate place. In that case, Aidan, could I ask that you make sure that the Chairman of People and Health are obviously aware so that we can do that. Um, I believe Councillor Mike Parks, do you have a question? Yeah, th thank you, Chairman. And, and um, I think thanks to Aidan for that heads up. I'm just interested, um, a, a, how much we're, we're talking in terms of significant costs and are these one-off costs or are they gonna be on costs um, moving forward as the Council proceeds. Aidan, I don't know if you want to answer that. I'm not sure if the first part of that is really for a scrutiny committee, but the second part I would suggest is for us. Um, so, uh, and this is why it's the biggest financial risk, because we don't know how much it's going to cost us yet. The, uh, the, the service, the, the reforms from October next year are going to impact in a, a number of ways. First of all, the, uh, at the moment, within the residential and nursing home care settings, uh, Dorset Council has a rate it pays for care and private payers, self-funders, pay a different rate. And it's sort of market driven. So there's a gap between the two. In the future, post these reforms, as part of these reforms, then people that are private payers will essentially be able to access the council's rate. And that means in order for the care market to be sustainable, it means the council rate will have to go up. The amount that it pays has to go up. So first of all, the, the care reform means that we will have to pay more for care than we do at the moment. The big unknown is uh, we, we don't know how many residents that will affect because we don't control the market in that way. We don't know how many private payers there are out there. That's some research we're doing with the care sector but we don't know the volumes involved on this, hence the, the so we don't know the price increase or the volumes of how it's going to impact us. And second element of this is uh, through the care reforms, we will be, um, because there's a, a finite amount that residents will be required to pay in the future, this cap uh, of uh, 85,000 or so, then there are residents that, that we will have to pay for that we don't currently for so so it's uh, sort of a two-dimensional increase from a from a council perspective uh, and we and we're sort of working through the costings at the moment the guidance is coming out from government on a daily basis and I've got a, a, a call with um, the government department at lunchtime today that we'll be going to dis discussing this further thank you Adam Mike did you want to come back on anything councillor Susan Cockey thank you chair I just wanted to ask Aidan um, because the service uses a financial contribution is not just for care and residential homes, but it's also for people who access day services. Um, and there's a lot of people who do use access day services and they have to pay a service user contribution. So I wonder whether they would fall into the same category and would that also have an impact on the council's budget? Uh, Thanks, yes, I've, I've kind of conflated two issues here. So in terms of the, uh, the internal audit review of care user contributions, I think there's some action points there that we really need to pick up. Uh, linked to that is, are the residential care charging reforms, uh, but clearly that's residential care, so uh, day care and home care have got their own existing arrangements. So there's a, a, a separation between the two. It's the residential care charging reforms I'm anxious about, 
but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't carry on implementing the internal audit findings around tightening up our controls uh, around the residential uh, contributions. Thank you, Aidan, because um, a lot of people who do use um, day services for, for, for going out for the day and things like that, they have to make quite a lot of contribution themselves as well, so it's quite an impact on the actual service user as well. So when we're actually looking at it, we need to take in mind of the actual service user as well, the impact on them and their families as well. So I just want the council to be mindful of that as well when we're actually looking at these um, figures and the impact on families as well, because it's not the impact just on the council, but it's the impact on families and carers. Um, Sally, just, just a couple of points from myself. Firstly, again, please pass on our, our thanks and our gratitude to all your staff for the help that they've given Dorset Council during the pandemic. It is really and has been very much appreciated. Um, I note the, um, the system of regular updates which have been introduced, which is mentioned on page 40. Again, that is very, very welcome, as is the workforce swap and finding savings within the system. Again, very much appreciated. Um, perhaps not now for you to answer, but um, can I just remind members that when swaps send through reports and there is that highlighted link, please do go into those links because there is a wealth of information in there which draws me to, um, on your tracker, there is a reference 45124 and 45129, which don't have dates attached to them. They are highlighted as red as in need to be dealt with, but there's no sign of any completion date unless my computer was throwing a tantrum at the time. There we go. <laughs> um, thank you, um, Councillor Hall. We'll, um, we will make a note of those and, and have a look. Um, but obviously, off the top of my head, I'm not going to be able to answer those. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. It's just uh, everything else is nicely and it's, it's easy for us as a committee to see where these dates are that completions should happen, which allows us to keep... keep I don't like using the word tabs on, but keeping tabs of what's going on. But obviously, if there isn't a date, it's just got a very strange red-coloured pattern in the date bit, which was a bit odd. Um, also, thank you again uh, with regards to the comments on page 43 about the work um, addressing the duplicate payment system. Um, this has been mentioned on numerous occasions by this committee, particularly through Councillor Suze and Cotton. So it's nice to see that we're aiming in... Um, the right direction for that. Uh, I'm also glad to see that the CFAS system appears to be helping the council, which is extremely good news. Um, I think that's it for me. Is there any other questions from any other members before we move on as this is a to note report? Okay, no other questions. Thank you, Sally. So if you move on to agenda item number six, which is the approach to the internal audit planning year 22 to 23, and then the internal audit charter. Um, again, over to you, Sally. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, traditionally, um, we've provided an annual audit plan or fixed list of proposed work for review and approval. Um, however, I think we would all agree uh, that change and unpredictability is very much here to stay um, and has become the new normal. Um, as such, we're proposing to continue to manage our approach to planning our audit work in the way that we have over the past couple of unpredictable and quite turbulent years. Um, we propose to continue with a rolling uh, planning approach where we build our plan from our continuous risk assessment conversations uh, with directorate management teams from general horizon scanning across our SWAT partners and the Institute of Internal Auditors professional view on current and emerging risks. Um, 
as, uh, as the chair mentioned earlier, you will all be familiar with our rolling plan spreadsheet, which records our audit plan and current record. Um, this record is accessible to senior managers and all members of the audit committee on a continuous basis. And this enables the organization to be confident that our program of work provides appropriate coverage of key risks. Finally, the audit charter, which can be found in a separate document at Appendix 1, details our service to Dorset Council and is a document that we take annually to the Audit Committee for approval. Happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you, Sally. Any questions, members? As nobody's jumping at the opportunity, I'll just sort of make a a general comment, some, some of which is um, looking at SWAT, but some of it is also looking at Aidan and Jonathan with regards to the senior leadership team. I think the way of making um, this committee and internal and audit for the council in general to work as it should be, I see this very much as a triangle of everybody working together with the three points being SWAT, ourselves as a committee, but then the senior leadership team and that sort of higher echelons of, of officers. I note several occasions within the report, there are references made to copying in, for example, Aidan as the 151 officer, and also in covering this agenda item and the previous one, there are a number of comments made about passing things on to the senior leadership team. I feel that sometimes it then stops so that certain people get the information and I'm not sure whether it should be coming to this committee or certainly coming to myself as chairman and Councillor Biggs as vice chairman to make sure that all the information is going around in the triangle as it could do and as I believe that it should do. So um, I appreciate that sometimes there are sensitive things which are not necessarily free to be passed around but I think it would be very helpful if moving forward that some of these things which are passed on are also passed on through either this committee or through myself as chairman, if that is something that perhaps yourself, Sally, can take away, but also Aidan and Jonathan perhaps to look. Because as I say, sometimes it appears that you find things that you pass on to the senior leadership team to deal with, and I got no idea where that goes. And I think I should, and I think this committee should. Even if at times it's just to say, don't worry, we've looked at this, we've dealt with this, it's nothing to worry about. It's, it's important, I think, that this is the triangle working. Uh, that's all. <laughs> um, any points from members? If not, thank you very much, Sally. Thank you both. Um, I think that's it for you on this agenda. You're more than welcome to stay, but I understand that your time is, is precious, so if you need to go, then, then please and do, and thank you for your, for your help and for your time. Thank you. Right, members, if we now move on to agenda item number seven, which is the risk management update to consider a report from Mark Eyre, Dorset Council Service Manager for Assurance. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, committee. So I'm Mark Howe, I'm the Service Manager for Assurance, and I'm joined today by David Trotter, who's our Risk and Resilience Officer. So the, the paper you've got in front of you today, it's the usual quarterly update of risks, and that includes within it, alongside each of those high or extreme risks that were identified, a management response from the responsible officer. For the first time, this report also includes two additional appendices, and those ones that we agreed last time when the risk report came to you. So there's one on information compliance, and a second one on emergency planning. For both information compliance and emergency planning, there will be occasions where risk events occur, so a, a, a data breach or a, an emergency incident. And when those do occur, we have a process of debriefing and making sure that we are learning lessons from them. So where, where, we, where we go through those processes, the, the future reports will summarize the key aspects of those. So a couple of bits that, that, that stand out. In terms of the information compliance appendice, you'll notice that within that, that it's showing at the moment a fairly low level of, of training. Um, I just wanted to cover that because there is, is a, a, a key reason why that is the case. And that's because the learning portal is now a year old. So the first year completions 
have started to expire, and therefore, we, in many ways, we sort of start again with people going into the into the, the second year. So the similar low levels across other mandatory training uh, for, for exactly the same reason. So we would hope to see that build up over coming months. In terms of the the new emergency planning appendice, this time around, it's a, it's a fairly basic overview. But as I say, we will intend to focus on debriefing actions in future. So the, the next report that we pick up in, which I think is due in September, will include within it some of the debriefing from the recent storm units and resultant power outages. Risk-wise, the majority of the risks that you see within the paper have been reviewed and updated. We agreed at the last committee that consideration of risk, um, it's, it's largely from a committee perspective over the assurance of the process rather than scrutiny of the risks themselves. Uh, I'm going to be further liaising with the scrutiny chairs as to how they can be best cited on the, on the risk registers. But within the recommendations, I included reference to whether the committee wants to consider uh, any particular risk areas that they feel should be escalated to the relevant scrutiny committee. And then just one final point in terms of general improvements. Um, David, our, our risk and resilience officer, has recently established a, a risk training module which now sits within the e-learning portal. And that was the key messages, Chair. Thank you, Mark. Any questions from members? Councillor Susan Cocking. Thank you, Chair. I'll keep remembering to turn my microphone on and off. Um, I just say thank you very much for a very comprehensive um, report. I like the um, two new um, bits. I know um, Mark already said about emergency planning and information compliance, but on page 71 of the current status and the direction of travel, it's quite nice to see a little bit more detail on that. Um, there is um, a couple of risks that I do have a concern about, but I'm not going to go into detail at the moment because I have emailed um, David Trotter and Mark Eyre. Um, it's about the Ukrainian situation and how that would actually impact on the council and some of the risk factors that are on the report. So I think it's just for a comment at the moment, just to note that perhaps we could look at that at some further detail when we do have more detail, but I don't want to go into it at the moment. But um, the officers are aware of some of my concerns. But um, yeah, I just think that we need to monitor that situation as well and the impact on the council from a risk perspective. Thank you, Susan. I don't know if Mark or David just wanted to make a brief comment. And probably, probably not really anything to add at this point, Chair, but we will be liaising with um, the points that, that Councillor Cocking's raised with the responsible officers. Any other questions from members? Councillor Biggs. Thank you, yes, I agree. It is um, a really, really good report. Um, and I, I think as has been said, we shouldn't be focusing necessarily on the, on the detail. We just need to ensure that they are being well managed. Um, and if we have concerns um, to make sure they go to the relevant scrutiny committee, I think that's quite correct. Um, there is one I've, I question, I have questioned it um, before with the SLT team as to why it's on there and, and that would be um, risk 378 which is on page 86 which is failure to inspire future generation of political leaders. I don't see why that is on there. I don't think that's the place of if it's as I interpret it. Um, it you know it's a good discussion point I'm sure amongst senior leaders but it's, it's not within their gift. It's not something that they can manage and it shouldn't be there in my view, but um, and I have looked at the risk and it says um, to be reviewed or something, but it, you know, it's been saying that for six months, so I don't know why that's still on there. So perhaps I could deal with that one first before we go back to my other questions, please. Did you want to comment on that, Mark? Um, I think it's very, Appreciate the, the comments. I probably the best thing is if I if I do take that back to SLT members outside of this meeting. Any other questions, Richard? Yep. Um, so the second question is around um, risk eighty three, which is on page twenty nine. I would view that this is about the non compliance with the pure regulations, which are to do with hoists and lifts. I would suggest that we do not have risks of our, which frankly are our own incompetence. We have to comply with legal regulations. Um, you know, I'm sure it's a worry of any manager in any that we fail to do
do all manner of things that put us in that position, but we shouldn't be having a risk, in my view, unless there's a strong case. I, th I think that should be a general sort of, you know, ruling. Generally, you don't have a risk of what, what is a failure to comply with legal regulation. I don't think that's appropriate, in my view, um, if, if that can be taken away and considered. Um, my second point, a third point, sorry, is, is around emergency planning. Good to see that that's there. I mean, it is very much focused on sort of lessons learned from sort of storm damage and things like that. But I, th I think obviously with events in Ukraine, we really should be thinking what emergency planning was 30 years ago, um, dusting off some of those uh, plans and seeing are we um, in a, a good position, I, I doubt we are, to deal with any um, nuclear situations that could unfortunately um, occur, hopefully, hopefully, that's that's not going to happen, but it, it, it is a it is a worry that should be considered, and I suspect you know that that planning has not been looked at for over thirty years. Um, a comment on that would be useful. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I mean, essentially, there, there, there are a range of, of uh, emergency plans that will link in with the, um, the Ukrainian issue. So, um, so some of them sort of, sort of more. Uh, severe incidents than others, but I mean it's certainly an area that the the local resilience forum is is focused in on. Councillor Mike Parks. Um, thank you, Chairman. I'd like to just raise some concerns around the um, information compliance. Um, if we and I do accept um, that mandatory training will have reset over a twelve month period, but if we if we look at um, what we've been presented with. Um, our progress trend, and I, and I don't know when this was because it's not clear on the report, um, was at 47.5% when we're looking for a target compliance of 100% um, of this mandatory training being completed. Um, dropped to 29.18% in, in January, and then in February it was 27.6%, um, so we're still on a downward trend. Um, bearing in mind that in February there were two data breaches that had to be be reported to the Information Commissioner. Um, I'd like to know what's being done to address um, what appears to be um, quite a serious issue that we've got here. Thanks, Chair. Um, as, as I say, I, th I think the, the, the reason the figures look as low as they do is because of that, that reset issue. I think when we last came to this committee, um, the, 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 at that point, the figures had got up to about, I think it was for memory, sort of late, it's near sort of 60, 70 percent. But I think we do we do accept that there is still work to be doing to further promote that training. As we, when we come on to the annual governance statement, as the next paper, it's one of the items identified in there as a as a as an area for for uh, further improvement. And did you want to make any comments about the data breaches? Yeah, I mean, so certainly, when, when, whenever we have a data breach, and the, the, the two that are referenced within that that paper. Um, are good examples of that. We do go through a process of uh, debriefing the incident, so we'll bring in the relevant um, officers, or, or certainly at a, at a more sort of senior level, and we'll look at exactly what the issue is surrounding those and whether or not there's any actual lessons to be learned from that, which are then fed back through to sort of in, in, enhance further um, uh, organisational learning. But I mean, in terms of anything that is actually escalated through to the uh, Information Commissioner's Office, one of the first questions they will also always ask is whether or not the mandatory training has been completed. In the event that it hasn't been, um, that will always be one of the actions that comes out for the person that's committed that breach to go through that training. Did you want to come back on anything, Mike? If I'm, if I'm out, Chairman, and uh, thank, you, thank you for the response on that, but it still concerns me that you know, even prior to this, we were still uh, only looking at somewhere between 60 and 70% compliance. Um, it just doesn't seem good enough. I think that in, in my own personal opinion, I think what Councillor Parks has raised is quite an important issue. And I appreciate the reset sort of um, argument, but I think that this committee needs more assurance 
from yourselves and from the senior leadership team that this is being addressed and being addressed at some pace. Because obviously, if we, as we are today, in a public meeting saying that our staff are supposed to be doing mandatory training and they're not doing mandatory training, we need to have more assurance coming from yourselves that this is being addressed so that in a few months' time we're not in a similar situation where we've got low fi figures for compliance. Um, I appreciate that we are coming uh, to later agenda item for the forward plan, but I would really like to see something coming forward to the next audit and governance committee with a what is happening, why it's happening, what we as a council are doing to address this situation with some timelines. Because I appreciate that with illness, holidays, etc., we can't necessarily go from this figure to 100% at the click of a finger, but we've got to be moving in a better direction than we appear to be. Can I leave that with yourselves? I think that's a, that's a fair ask, Chair. Yeah, we'll, we'll take that away. Thanks. Councillor Susan Cocking. Thank you, Chair. Um, I did last ask, I'm sure it was at the last meeting, about councillor training, because I think it's not just the onus on um, the staff, it is on councillors as well, and we haven't got any figures about councillors do the cyber training with boxfish and we haven't how many councillors do actually do that because that's mandatory as well and we're we're more incapable of breaching data breach by forwarding an email or something like that and i think if the staff are being held accountable then i think as councillors we should be held accountable so i'd like to see some figures on how many councillors do actually do that training um and and what the process is if they're not doing it so i think we need to be just as accountable as the staff Thank you, Susan. I'm not sure, Mark, if you could take those comments away and perhaps touch base with Hayley Caves or somebody else in Democratic Services. Um, I think the points are well made. We, we, we are all uh, have the ability to do data breaches if we're not thinking correctly or not trained correctly. So therefore, it is important because sometimes it's not only a question of that councillors might not have done the training, but they might not have been aware that the training actually existed. I think that's a, a fair point, Chair, and I'll, I'll certainly take that away. I mean, just for the, the committee's um, interest as well, there is a, a separate um, training module being created specifically for members on, on uh, data protection at the moment, which will form part of the overarching e-learning module. Any other questions from members? Then I'll just make um, a couple of points. Aidan, I don't know if you've got your pen to hand. Um, obviously, there's a large amount of risks on here, most of which are to go to the various scrutiny committees. But I think there are a number which have an audit and governance link, which by my reckoning is 345, 346, 212, 388, 393, 316. 286 and 348. Um, I'd appreciate if, when you had a moment, if you could look at those and see whether those are things which are naturally coming up um, and being addressed in presentations that yourself or Jim might be doing in the near future, or whether we actually need to be looking at bringing some of those perhaps to um, our forward plan for, for later comments. Um, one point I'd like to make to yourself, Mark, which is with regards to the emergency planning. I think that we are perhaps uh, missing something, and I don't know how best to explain it. So, so the emergency planning seems to be that type of thing that covers, for example, the pandemic. It covers storm damage, et cetera. I draw your attention to the current issue with the road closure of the A30 in Sherbourne, which has been caused by a third party wall collapse onto the road. Now, this might not be deemed emergency for the majority of residents or officers within Dorset, but for Sherbourne, it's hugely important, particularly with the tourist season coming up. And it just appears 
the Dorset Council doesn't quite seem to know how to handle the situation. And I think that needs to be looked at. Because if this type of situation has happened once, it is likely to happen again at some point, some place, somewhere in Dorset. And I think there has been some reputational damage to Dorset Council because of it being perceived by residents as not being forthcoming. If I could just leave that with you to, to look into, I'd really appreciate that. The other comment that I would make, which is a comment which I've made before, <clears throat> and this is particularly aimed at, at, at yourself, Jonathan, as it's within your directorate. I think that personally, the work that Mark Hare and David Trotter are doing to bring risk and the management of it forward in this council is to be commended. I think the work that they are doing is staggering. But I think one of the greatest risks this council has got is we depend an awful lot on two people. And it really worries me that if one of those gentlemen were off long-term sick, where would it leave the progress that we're making? I appreciate that finances are tight. I appreciate the budgets are set, but it really concerns me. So if I could just leave that with you to perhaps look into, um, come up with perhaps some suggestions and let me know, that would be really appreciative. Um, while I've been talking, has members thought of any other questions? I take that as a no. So the recommendation for agenda item seven is one, to note and review the key risks identified in the corporate and service risk register with escalation to scrutiny committees where appropriate. I believe we have done that. Number two is to note and review the key metrics and headlines from the emergency planning. Again, we have done that. Three is to note and review the key metrics and headlines from the information compliance. Again, we have done that, and our officers have got a number of things to go away and to look at. So therefore, there is nothing um, to vote on that, which therefore takes us to agenda item. Sorry, Councillor Biggs. It just occurred to me, we have a number of, number of actions where we, we've asked officers to go away, which they've agreed to do so. How, how will we report back? Will we get a, an email? Will there be something in the public record? Will it come to the next committee? Because I hate to see these things just sort of drift, get kicked into the long grass, and we, we never hear from it. I assume they're being minuted and, and recorded. Thank you. Jonathan? Chairman, if, if they are actions that have been minuted for officers to take, um, then progress with those would have to be reported back to this committee. I don't think it would be appropriate to deal with things solely. If they've been minuted here as actions to take, I think they should be reported back here. Thank you for that clarification, Jonathan. I mean, the comments that I was making about staff, obviously I don't necessarily expect you to come back uh, with comments to full council about that, although I think it would be appreciated by members. Um, the comments that we've made with um, addressing the training, I think that has to come back as a council agenda item, and I'd like to see that done as soon as possible. Um, as I was saying, on to agenda item number eight, which is the annual governance statement, and this report again is from Mark Eyre. Thank you, Mark. Thanks again, Chair. Um, so this relates to the annual governance statement, uh, which is a statutory document that accompanies the annual accounts. And it sets out an assurance that our governance arrangements across Dorset Council are fit for purpose, but it also identifies any areas identified for improvement. It follows SIP for guidance and is signed off each year by the leader and the chief executive. The statement reflects back on the previous 12 months. So it's looking at 1st of April 2021 through to 31st of March 2022 consists of the statement itself and then is supported by a local code of corporate governance that sets out in a bit more detail some of the control measures that we have in place. And then the final document that would uh, normally support, well, would support the actual final uh, version of the annual governance statement is the schedule of high risk, which we looked at in the, with the last paper. So um, I was just gonna touch on a, a few of the actions for improvement that are identified for, for the, the, the coming year, and that's well, something that we've already talked about this morning, which is the mandatory training improvements. Um, also look, looking further at the assurance mapping and fraud risk assessment work that's been commenced. Looking to improve compliance rates for subject access requests, improved use of data privacy impact assessments, and then rollout of the Dorset Council-wide 
information asset register. So um, that's probably, probably all really I need to add at this point. It is the committee's first opportunity to see the annual governance statement, and in the past years, comments have been fed back that we've then reflected back into the revised statement. And um, if, if required, we can, we can obviously come back to you with a refined document. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Mark. Any questions from members? I'll take that as a no. Mark, I think that the report is really good. I, I, I like the uh, points that you've addressed. The only thing I would say is it, at times it reads a little wordy. Um, I think sometimes it's, it's difficult for all of us to remember that sometimes these reports are almost for residents to read almost more than ourselves. And I think sometimes when things become a little too wordy, it doesn't necessarily capture the imagination. So I just wonder whether, if you've got a spare few minutes, if you could just perhaps just have a look, just to see if it, it, if it could flow better. Happy to do that, Chair, thank you. As there's no um, questions from members, I believe that is to note as well, isn't it, Mark? Thank you very much for that report. So, members, we now move on to agenda item nine, which is the quarter three financial management report, which will be over to Aidan and Jim. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, the we're conscious that the quarter three financial report uh, feels sort of quite out of date now, given that it was the financial position to the end of uh, December. So uh, in a moment, Jim's going to talk us through that, uh, that financial position and, and obviously an opportunity for members to explore the uh, issue. But I think what's really pressing at the moment is the uh, cost of living crisis and the impact that that's having on our residents, but also the impact it's having on council services. So if, um, if you'll indulge us, we'll, Jim will give an overview of quarter three position, and then I've invited along our finance business partners here who are on, on hand to give a little, uh, to give a flavor of some of the pressures that the individual services are experiencing at the moment. Um, so if that's, um, that would be helpful. So Jim, if I could hand over to you. Thank you, can you hear me all right? One chair, members. Um, I'm Jim McManus, Corporate Director for Finance and Commercial. Uh, so first, first of all, um, offer Gary, Councillor Gary Suttles, apologies. Um, it's his intention to, to attend these meetings in case there are questions for him, but he's just unable to attend today. Um, but the um, quarter three report, uh, as seen by Kevin on the 18th of January, as Aidan said, a um, bit out of date now. It's so important to kind of give some context uh, of, of what happened as, and where we're going as well. So as you'll have seen in the report, forecast overspend uh, reduced steadily throughout the year, 8.3 million at quarter one, 4.8 million at quarter two, uh, down to 1.3 million in the quarter three report. There are improvements in performance against budget across many of the service areas, uh, and these are continuing, did continue uh, into the final quarter of the year. We're closing the accounts for 21-22 at the moment, uh, but Councillor Suttle has already indicated in other public meetings that uh, he and the finance team and managers around the council anticipate our outturn being very close indeed to uh, the budget that was uh, set and agreed. That doesn't mean, of course, that we won't continue to face significant financial challenges. Clearly, we <coughs> will do for quite some time. Um, we've already talked this morning, for example, about fair cost of care coming in. That will continue to put pressure on council budgets, as will our, our d demography and uh, uh, business rates and other sources of funding. So among those you'll hear uh, shortly from, from colleague Heather uh, Lappin, Head of uh, Strategic Finance. Um, so she'll talk a little bit about what, have we, what we've done to include price pressures in our 22-23 budgets. Uh, that was and it is significant, but we're facing sustained inflationary pressures. So we need to continue to monitor that situation extremely closely and carefully. And I'll remind members of our processes for that uh, at the end as part of the round. As Aidan said, finance business partners are here to pick up any directorate specific questions, so I'll um, keep to a very brief summary of the report. Uh, section 1154 talks about collection rates for local, council, local tax, so that's council tax and uh, business rates. So um, pleasingly, they're ahead of last year, but unsurprisingly, uh, still lagging pre-pandemic levels of 2019-20. Of those continue to be reported in the cabinet report and will um, include more detail on those and the collection fund outturns in the draft outturn report that comes to Cabinet. 
some government funding has been received to support collection funds. Um, we anticipate that the impact of that won't necessarily be in 21-22. Uh, it will be on future years as the um, lower collection rates potentially feed through into uh, amounts that aren't collected. That's when the support from that fund is needed. Section 12 talks a little bit about savings targets and delivery uh, of, of those. Uh, the performance there, we were mindful of that when we uh, did the budget setting work for 22-23, all of that fed in. Section 13 talks a little bit about reserves and the fact that another review of those is underway as part of our close down process uh, and will include any reserves changes or recommendations to cabinet in the uh, outturn report that comes in June. Section 14, finally, in terms of detail, just to note the capital programme continued slippage uh, and savings that that means in the um, current, well, previous financial year now, and I always get lost in between financial years, apologies. Uh, so there'll be savings to the revenue budget in 21-22 as a result of the capital programme slippage. Part of the requirement to continue to review that, to see if schemes uh, are ongoing, are still relevant for uh, the council to deliver given that, um, given that delay. So um, if there are any questions, happy to take them now. Otherwise, um, hand over to Heather for a little bit more detail on inflation. I think we do questions at the end, I think. So over to you, Heather. Good morning, members. Heather Lappin, Head of Strategic Finance. When the Council set its budget for 22-23, the inflation allocation set aside in the budget will pay inflation of 2.25%, which totals 3.1 million, fees and charges of 2.5%, which totaled 1.9 million, energy inflation of 5%, which totaled 165,000. For general inflation, a total of £13 million was put into budget. 12 million of this was specific inflation with an additional 985,000, which was set aside in the contingency budget to be distributed for other contract costs. In addition to this, there were other inflationary amounts built into the budget, which were not easily identified due to such changes in volumes as well as inflation. Additional funding allocations were given as part of the final settlement from government, so the contingency budget has £8.7 million available that could be used to support inflation and other pressures. I'm going to pass you over to my colleague Dawn to talk about contract pressures. Thank you. Good morning, Dawn Adams, um, Service Manager for Commercial Procurements. I'm just going to talk to you about what, what is our contract approach. Due to the current inflation rates, we are having to work with suppliers during one of the hardest inflationary environments we've seen for decades. With over 50% of our annual budget being spent on buying external goods, services and works, it's important that we work with our suppliers to help maintain financial stability. In most markets, we're seeing high level of price upheaval and other pressures. Two examples, in construction, there's not only price fluctuations, but material availability issues compounded by the recent energy crisis and problems of haulage and logistics with additional fuel prices and some fuel shortage. Another example, nationally, fuel pricing is impacting on transport services. As recently reported by County Council's network, this report has reflected that when local authorities are re-tendering for transport, tenders are coming back at significantly higher prices than those of last year. Leading up to any procurement exercise, so we're working with business areas to monitor their market and decide accordingly whether it's right time to tender. We have recently launched our guiding principles to managing contract price to provide contract managers the approach to effective management of contract price. This is at pre-procurement, procurement, that's pre-contract and in contract once we've awarded. This is complementary to other contract management tools we have in place, such as formal training. And I'll hand you over to my colleague, Dawn. <coughs> Thank you, Dawn. Morning, everyone. Paul Ackrell, um, finance business partner for Place Directorate. Um, can I just start off by saying um, we're not able to talk about any specific contractual arrangements or any specific numbers, um, just because that might be commercially sensitive information. So anything that hasn't already been published in the general context of, of budget numbers, we can't really talk about. Um, but a few general things around place directorate in terms of the budget setting process uh, and also what kinds of contracts that we have in place. In terms of the budget setting process, um, in terms of non-pay, as, as Heather has already said, um, inflation was put aside in central budgets, so no non-pay inflation has been given to the place directorate, and place directorate budget holders will need to 
apply for that funding from the centre and there was a, a process in place um, for them to do that uh, with a bit of, bit of scrutiny and challenge attached. Uh, there's one exception to that, which is the PFI street lighting contract, um, which was just fortuitous that the street lighting contract saw a large um, rebate last year. And the ongoing effect of that, we're able to reapply into the budget uh, and no extra cost. So that, that budget sorts itself out. But the other budgets uh, essentially all have no inflation attached at the moment. In terms of contract types, for existing contracts, we've got two types of contracts. We've got contracts that are fixed at price for X number of years, whatever the period of the contract might be, but do allow for an annual inflation uplift attached to um, whatever the particular index is for that particular um, contract. So, for example, the various waste disposal contracts are attached to CPI as at last December, which was 5.4%. Um, that's not one contract, that's a whole bundle of contracts, but when you add all those up, they are um, a number of millions of pounds, so 5.4% on those is a significant cost pressure. Um, we also have contracts where the price isn't fixed, but is pegged to um, the marketplace. So, for example, purchase of vehicle fuel. We have a very good contract with purchasing vehicle fuel where prices will be considerably better than what you or I pay at the forecourt, but they still do fluctuate up and down on a monthly basis. Pegs to the forecourt prices. Um, so difficult to forecast those costs with any degree of accuracy. And where contracts are coming to an end, we're looking at re-procurement. In the past couple of months, we've seen some re-procurements come in, um, and we've seen prices increasing in the range of 50 to 60 percent. Um, so I think really I'll, I'll conclude my section by saying that Place Directorate is facing some potentially significant inflation costs. Some of them we can pin down with accuracy. Some of them are still quite speculative at the moment. I'll hand over to my colleague, Sean, for adults. Good morning, Sean White, Service Manager, supporting adults and housing. So as mentioned earlier in the meeting, there are two main areas within adult social care which will impact over the next 12 months. Firstly, the introduction of the care cap, and secondly, linked to this is the market sustainability and fair cost of care exercise. From October 2023, the government will introduce a new £86,000 cap on the amount that anyone in England will need to spend on their personal care over their lifetime. In addition, the upper limit, the point at which people become eligible to receive some financial support from their local authority, will rise to £100,000 from the current 22250 The lower capital limit, the threshold below which people will not have to pay anything for their care from, that, from their assets, will increase to £20,000 from the current 14250 The reforms raise several key issues and impacts for local authorities and cover financial, so the number of people local authorities are required to fund will increase. The rates local authorities pay for care will increase as they become responsible for a greater percentage of the market. Secondly, workforce, so the number of assessments local authorities will need to undertake will increase significantly. Staff will need to be trained on new legislation. And numbers of complaints will increase as clients will want to reach their cap sooner and want a greater level of cost to account against their care costs. There will be an impact on the number of direct payments and debt recovery. And lastly, systems. Local authorities will have to track costs self-funded via the independent personal budget. Clients moving between local authorities will add complexity in the likelihood of two financial regimes being in operation at once. The reforms will be funded by a 1.25% increase in employees and employers' national insurance contributions which is expected to raise £12 billion annually over the next three years. Most of this additional funding will be allocated to the NHS. 
the Dorset Council has been awarded £1.2 million from the Market Sustainability and Fair Cost of Care Fund for 2022-23. The government requires local authorities to start building strong foundations and prepare markets for the wider charging reform and thereby increasing market sustainability. The primary pr purpose of this fund is to support local authorities to move towards paying providers a fair cost of care to prepare their markets and adult social care reform. A fair and sustainable care market is fundamental to the government's reforms to adult social care. As a condition of receiving future funding, local authorities will need to evidence the work that they are doing to prepare for the markets by submitting a cost of care exercise, market sustainability plans and spend reports to the Department of Health and Social Care. Prior to this guidance being published, Dorset Council have started to undertake a fair cost of care exercise and the results of this are currently being reviewed along with the financial impact. Thank you. I'll pass over to my colleague, Lee House. Good morning, Lee House, Finance Business Partner Supporting Children's Services. So adults have really um, stated a lot of what the pressures will be, the workforce pressures which will be facing us. However, we know that within children's services, there's going to be pressures around our external providers for residential care. We are seeing um, anecdotal evidence of increases ranging from sort of 2 to 15% for some providers. Our brokerage team are working closely with the suppliers to monitor and manage this relationship, and it's not to say that these rates are going to apply. This is just the sort of pressures that we could be experiencing in next finan or this financial year. We're also bound by certain frameworks, where um, uh, regional frameworks, and so that may have an impact upon us. We also have um, inflationary pressures potentially around direct payments um, to parents to help support um, support um, them at home. And this is, may also experience pressures around short breaks as well. So essentially, we are monitoring as we go through, but it's important to acknowledge that we potentially will have additional pressures that are above and beyond what's been built into the budgets. Thank you. Neil Gorman, Service Manager for Corporate Services. I'm just going to give a brief summary on the salary assumptions. As, mentioned, as Heather mentioned, within the budget for 2022-23, 2.25% yearly inflationary assumption was applied and this was going to be a monetary value of 3.1 million. As a reminder for the 21-22 budget, a 1.75% inflation was agreed, which is factored into the corresponding budget data. Should this percentage also be agreed for 22-23, then 0.7 million could potentially be freed up from the budget to cover potential other pressures. Conversely, should a higher percentage be agreed for each applicant increase, this would take to a chunk of 1.5 million pounds of budget pressure. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, colleagues, thank you for, for valuable inputs there. Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, Chair, in terms of next steps, uh, what do we do next? What are we doing at the moment? Currently closing the 21-22 accounts. We'll understand what our outturn position is there. Uh, that will be reported uh, on an unaudited basis to Cabinet on their 21st of June meeting. Uh, and at that stage, we'll be making recommendations to Cabinet about the levels of reserves uh, in line with our reserve strategy statement, which will need to be updated slightly in light of the outturn, um, and particularly uh, in light of the uh, high needs block work that's been done uh, for the dedicated schools grant during the course of the year. For the new financial year, we're continuing to monitor budgets monthly. We've uh, already moved into a, a, an AP naught forecast position where we're renewing, uh, reviewing our early predictions of uh, the current financial year. Uh, and the governance process around that information is to update Section 151 Officer First, uh, senior leadership team colleagues, portfolio holder for finance and then uh, cabinet. Uh, and obviously we'll continue to, uh, with the formal cabinet reporting cycle, uh, quarterly for cabinet and then on to uh, audit and governance committee after that. Thank you. Any questions, members? Richard. Hi, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your reports. They were really interesting and enlightening. And especially you can understand the um, pressures on adults and children's services. My question really was about um, procurement, not specifically about um, a, a supplier or anything, but are you finding, because of the pressures, because of inflation, that suppliers perhaps are going out of business or may not want to do business with the council? Is that something that you, you would be looking at as, a, as, as some risk to the council that there may not be such an open market to councils now? 
I'll, I'll respond to that because um, that's my area, food procurement. Um, yes, we are finding um, suppliers are hesitant to actually engage with us. Um, so we've had some good feedback through some tendering that, that uh, they are finding it difficult to price up their supplies. So what we'd be doing is we actually are looking at our top suppliers and understand how critical they are with, our, with the council and doing due diligence on terms of financial stability. So we, we do that as part of the council, but we actually actively actually looking at our top suppliers to see what risks they are, because um, a contract criticality and supply resilience is something we need to be um, look at and monitor with us. Yes, thank you. It's, I think it's, personally, I find it rather deeply worrying. Um, we have been warning, I think, this committee for some time that inflation is going to be the, the number one risk, and we were banging on about it, and the members were at the budget cafes, um, and it's, it has come probably worse than we anticipated. Um, I, I do think we need to be, I think the estimates were based on what was considered to be a sort of most likely outcome, looking at all the scenarios. Nobody could predict what, what was going to happen. Even I, I, mean, I think we all thought COVID was the worst, and it's turned out other world events have, 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 have surpassed that. So I really think we need to be considering whether we do proper three-point estimating with a, a maximum and most likely and a minimum scenarios, and building those in, which will give us more, perhaps more accurate, more accuracy um, in future times. Um, I think another factor that we, something we raised here is about the, the ability of contracts, um, which have clauses quite fairly obviously to, to raise in terms of CPI. Um, most of our framework contracts have that, but I think what we need to be assured is good contract management, because usually within those contract terms, um, is conditions if it can be demonstrated that they have actually incurred that cost. Um, and working with contractors, it's often possible to make sure that they can do things another way so that they don't just slavishly just pass that cost straight on to the, the taxpayer. Um, so I think that's something that maybe, I don't know if that's for us or whether it's for scrutiny committees to ensure that a good contract management is being incurred. Um, another point I think is it particularly mentions about residential homes in, in children's and the costs, big costs of that, but again that's something to be warning um, and whether we should be looking at bringing more in-house provision as in the harbour in Weymouth. Um, I know private operators are currently expanding their operations in our towns and quite understandably we should be really looking at that equation, whether we get, you know, that is the, the value for money going forward. We should perhaps rethinking our decision um, to perhaps reverse that trend as, uh, you know, we've got a few now, but I think we ought to be thinking, really looking at that equation um, with that capital outlay, I appreciate. Um, but we've got opportunity to build quality units to our um, spec rather than providers sort of buying up residential properties, which are often not particularly suitable. Um, and I think that's something that children, sh and I'm sure they are, but I think perhaps they need to be accelerating that and that'd be something we wish to comment on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, some really um, helpful uh, points there. So if I uh, reply to a few of them. So first of all, our forecasting, as Jim said, we'll bring to cabinet the quarter one financial position and already we're teasing out in the reporting that we're doing internally the those inflation pressures and trying to dist uh, sort of distinguish from the demand pressures just to give us a sense of the the trend of where things are going in terms of the risk um, uh, the deputy chair makes a, a a really valid point that this was highlighted through the budget setting process that inflation was already started to increase and indeed it's gone <laughs> gone further so just to pull out a couple of numbers that colleagues uh, said and Heather said in the introduction. So having, having set the budget, we've given a, a general inflation uplift, we've uplifted some specific high risk areas by a little bit more, and then we've set aside funding in the contingency. And as Heather said, we've got 8.7 million set aside as a contingency budget. 
and then beyond that, we've then got our, our reserves and our general fund reserve is sort of uh, around about 35 million, 33, 33 million now as a general fund reserve, which remains our safety net. So in terms of trying to uh, have a sort of a stable uh, organizational environment, uh, that, I, that feels, you know, reasonable but it's never going to be as much as we uh, obviously would, would would love to have but 8.7 million and 35 uh, 33 million uh, in reserve secondly the point about contract management is something that uh, dawn in particular has really raised the profile of across the organization and just to join up a, a couple of points so on the one hand absolutely about contract management and Dawn's uh, running a program across the organization about raising the standards of our contract managers across the organization. But it's not simply about thumping the table and being really firm, because as Councillor Cotton has just described, um, it, it, you know, if, if suppliers can't afford to, sub, to, to supply us, then they hand the contract back and we're, we're left with nothing. So there's a, a fine balance uh, to, um, to, to reach, but, but the point you make about Talking, talking to suppliers to find out, is there a way that, what can we do to help the suppliers reduce their costs so that they don't experience the price, price inflation, so they don't try and pass it on to us? And that's, that's the fine line that we're, we're learning to navigate between being a firm contract manager, but also having an open relationship as well with those suppliers so we can understand their cost drivers and, and try and sort of navigate that, uh, that careful line. Um, and what we're finding across the organization is we've got some really talented and skilled individuals uh, and we want to share that skill across the organization. So uh, Dorset Council is such a varied organization. For example, our, our team, I believe our team that deal with waste contracts are really particularly skilled about waste contracts. And what we're wondering is, are those skills, are they transferable into say adult care or children's services and vice versa? So we're trying to learn off each other internally uh, as well. So we've got uh, set up a contract management network, which I think will be particularly helpful. And then uh, the final point about uh, insourcing uh, and are there any, uh, do we have greater control if we insource services? I think uh, you're right in the way you've described about children's services, and indeed that's uh, to a certain extent the model we're doing with education, with the uh, St. Mary's school site, that, that general, the, the business case is modeled on the fact that we believe that by controlling the school directly, we'll be able to provide services, good quality services at a lower cost than the market driven service. I think it does depend on the nature of the business we're in, I think, uh, and children's and education is a really good example. Uh, conversely, I don't think uh, in terms of some of the waste contracts, in terms of disposal, we might not be the right organization to run that. So we, we try and be sophisticated in our analysis, but it's certainly organizationally, we're very open to the idea of insourcing when it, when it suits. Thank you. No, but thank you, that, that's really useful, and I, I think that's, uh, important um, particularly your your views on contract management i think that getting that sort of partnership arrangement and getting that balance is, is really important and that's really useful i have just thought of one other question um which will hopefully um place have dealt with within their forecasting but uh, um the, the changes in red diesel um the, the tax so the number of groups are now not allowed to use red diesel i understand that waste services um, well, one of the categories that can no longer use red diesel. I'm not aware that, I wonder if, if, if anyone has that knowledge and whether that's been something that's been uh, accounted for. And if, if we weren't using it, why weren't we? <laughs> uh, Paul Ackrell again. Um, not accounted for within the budget. It has raised its head within the recent um, exercise that Jim referred to that we call AP0, which is looking ahead uh, at the year ahead forecast financial issues it has raised its head there um i'm not i'm not close to the detail so i'm, I'm not sure if there are areas that uh where it does or doesn't apply but yes it, it has raised its head and it's being explored any other questions from members no okay i think um taking on board some of the comments that councillor biggs has made i think the 
Although this committee is often told off that it's to look at the past and not look at the future, uh, unfortunately, we do have to look at the future. And what will make or break this year's budget is inflationary pressures. And I don't know how simple that this request is, is to do, but for, for many councillors, for I'm sure many staff and for most residents, inflation is that figure that is posted on the BBC News, which is about shopping baskets and things like that, which is not the inflation figures that many of our directorates actually face. So I think as we move forward across this year, I think we as a committee, I'm sure, but probably the council as a whole, could do with understanding clearer what the inflationary cost pressures are per directorate. Because it is going to be, I'm sure, considerably varying between the different directorates. And I think it's useful for us to help understand and hopefully for the council to plan for the future to understand what those effects are. You know, there's further sanctions that may be placed on Russia, particularly on the sale of oil, for example, um, that could be almost decided today, can have an instant effect tomorrow, which will affect the directorates in a different way or affect pricing structures in a different way. <clears throat> and although it's, it's uh, helpful to know from the comments that Jim was making that you know, finances are you know, being reviewed on that sort of monthly basis, I think we're living in a time where that almost needs to be a weekly basis because things can change so quickly. And I think we need as reassurance, particularly as, a, as an audit and governance committee where for the last three years, we've shown consistent concerns about the budgets between children and adults. Uh, I think we, we would be reassured to know what those inflationary pressures are and specifics about how we're as a council trying to address those and to meet our obligations, it would be helpful for us to know, for example, you know, a lot is placed on the former St. Mary's site, which obviously has had delays. I think we would be reassured to know what the new time frame is for that. I think it just, I appreciate you're all busy, but I think at this particular time, this particular episode in this world's history, I think we need a lot more information perhaps sooner than what would naturally be uh, given for us as a council to be able to react in a timely fashion. Um, you know, obviously we had to, uh, for various reasons, cancel the, the, the previous audit and governance committee. So this look at quarter three figures is obviously a bit late. We can't as a council with all these inflationary pressures be having instances where we need to act sooner and not being in a position to do so. So perhaps I'm looking for some reassurance from yourself, Aidan, perhaps on these things. Yeah, th uh, thank you. So uh, it, as you say about looking forwards, looking back, what this exercise has helpfully highlighted is by looking at the current way that we report our finances, and given the pace of inflation, you're making recommendations about how we report in the future to cabinet. Uh, and absolutely, it's our intention to go into more detail about these high risk areas, about the level of inflation already. And I think, uh, Jim, the team already starts to break down that analysis as we, I appreciate we're only sort of 12 days into the new financial year, but we're working on mechanisms so that we can draw that out, and be able to highlight it to cabinet, highlight it to colleagues, um, uh, and uh, to, the, to the council as a whole, but in particular, highlight it to ourselves so we can do something about it where we can. I mean, some, some of these issues are, you know, uh, with the greatest respect, uncontrollable, aren't they? We have to react to the market, but some of them uh, it might mean that we can do a course correct or we can take uh, proactive action. But, but I think you're absolutely right and we take the point that more information is needed on these sensitive areas and that's, uh, we have every intention of providing that to you uh, through our reporting mechanisms. And my final point question is, and, and I presume we are and I hope we are, that this council along with councils throughout the land are making um, the necessary noises at government level because there are, I'm sure, a finite line between what this council and others can manage in terms of inflationary cost pressures 
and what it cannot without assistance from either the government or a redressing of the services that we provide. And I would like reassurance that we as a council are trying to do the former and not the latter. Yeah, uh, thank you. So uh, a few comments on that. First, first of all, the, um, the leader of the council is very strongly of the view that Dorset doesn't get its fair share of government funding. And I was on a call with him uh, two or three weeks ago talking to Michael Gove, uh, Secretary of State, about that, about um, the importance of having the, the funding formula, national funding formula, making sure that it reflects the demographics and the challenges that Dorset face. Uh, so that's the, the first point. Secondly, yes, across the country, the sector is experiencing these, uh, these pressure, pressures. And through, in particular, through our various uh, organizational bodies, we're making that point. So, uh, for example, I'm a member of the Society of County Treasurers who contact government directly, uh, and in particular, DLUC, uh, the relevant government department, to impress upon them the pressures we're experiencing. And the third example, we heard from Sean, and we spoke earlier about the cost of the so social care reforms are going to hit local government hard. I don't think local, uh, I don't think nationally, uh, government has a real understanding of that uh, yet, and that's uh, why I'm part of a small group I mentioned that's meeting at lunchtime today uh, to once again gather that information and put put together a a well-reasoned explanation and argument to government for increased funding to reflect the local needs so that we can protect our residents uh, from these uh, cost increases. And just a final, final question as the word budget was mentioned. Any news of when we can actually sign our accounts off? Uh, so we've had our, our audit partner is on leave this week, but um, we've had conversations and correspondence with him recently, uh, most notably um, from the local pension board and the pension fund committee, because there is pressure on them to get the pension fund account signed off because every other um, member of the fund has an issue with those. So uh, I think <laughs> the update that we had um, just prior to our partner going on leave was that they were still working with the Financial Reporting Council to address some issues that had arisen from the FRC's review of Deloitte's work into Dorset Council, amongst others. Um, that was a programme review rather than anything specific that came to light. Um, once that was done, they were able to then recommence work in earnest on our audits, which weren't finished yet, weren't concluding. Um, there, is, there are some timing issues. Um, so the pension fund accounts have to go as an appendix to the um, administering authorities' accounts, Dorset Council in this case. So pension fund can't be signed off without Dorset Council's accounts being signed off. We have also uh, been alerted to the fact that nationally there is an issue around highways infrastructure assets for local authorities, which SIPFA are working on at the moment. So it's unlikely that um, Deloitte will be able to sign off the accounts for the year ending 31st of March 21 any time soon. Um, so what we have asked the in-house to do when he returns from leave is make it his priority to write to the local pension board chair, pension fund committee chair, and give an outline of his expectations um, around when the audits can be con concluded. Thank you, Jim. Um, any other questions, members? Okay, that um, agenda item was to note and to comment on, so thank you all very much for your help and for your presentations, very much appreciated. Uh, we'll move now swiftly on to agenda item number 10, uh, which is um, Jim to give us a presentation on REVs and benefits service update. Thanks, Chair. Yes, I was gonna share my screen, but with the, the things that can sometimes happen with that, um, I, I won't do that. I will um, refer you to page uh, 175 onwards uh, in your uh, agenda pack papers where my presentation slides are. Uh, so it's a, a, an update stock take position really of, of where we've got to um, and a little bit of context to start off with. So prior to local government reorganization for Dorset, what became Dorset Council, revenues and benefits services were delivered by uh, two different organizations, Stour Valley Pool Partnership and South Dorset uh, Partnership. Um, at local government reorganization, 1st of April 2019, the South Dorset Partnership was consolidated into Dorset Council. So, Revs and Ben services for 
uh, all customers that were in West Dorset, Weymouth and Portland and Purbeck areas were then managed by Dorset Councils. Dorset Councils, uh, the South Dorset Partnership effectively then lost its joint committee status, which Stour Valley and Paul Partnership uh, continued uh, under um, BCP Council as the host authority. So BCP Council uh, in SVPP form delivers, continues to this day to deliver services for uh, residents for the former East Dorset District Council and North Dorset District Council areas. Um, so at local government reorganisation date, uh, the two councils, two new unitary authorities, shadow uh, executives and councils had agreed that partnership arrangements wouldn't be reviewed initially for a period of at least 12 months. Um, then of course we had the pandemic. Following that, Dorset Council reviewed its own partnership arrangements. Um, one of those, uh, Stow Valley Pool Partnership, resulting in a report uh, to its own cabinet in early December, and we'll come back to that in a second. So on to page 177 of your pack, uh, just to highlight some of the governance arrangements that went round the eventual decision. Not all boards of governance were considering the same decision, um, but that went through the Stour Valley Pool Partnership's own board, uh, which is the Section 151 officers uh, of the two uh, councils in particular. Uh, then on to the scrutiny panel prior to the joint committee meeting uh, of the SVPP meeting. Uh, the um, Proposed decisions that Dorset Council's cabinet was asked to take then went through the Place and Resources Overview Committee prior to going to Dorset Council's own cabinet on the 7th of December. Uh, obviously now coming here to this committee for uh, a position statement, which I'm giving now, uh, and then we'll go on in line with the original recommendation to Place and Resources Scrutiny Committee to oversee the uh, integration and then the development of the future of the revenues and benefits services for Dorset Council. So page 178, uh, where we've got to, uh, following the cabinet decision, a delegation was given to, um, from, from, from cabinet to the section 151 officer, uh, and the same was true for BCP Council. So we then have a letter of agreement between uh, Aidan Dunn and Adam Richards uh, for BCP Council, signed on the 30th of March, which set out arrangements for ending the partnership. Um, important point to note really that the, there is a, a collaboration agreement that was inherited by Dorset Council and BCP Council for uh, predecessor authorities that were party to uh, that collaboration agreement. But rather than go down the uh, collaboration agreement terms, uh, other amicable terms were set out in those uh, two officer delegated decisions which have now been published by, by both councils. So it's not the formal collaboration agreement that will lead to the dissolution of the partnership, Stour Valley Pool Partnership, but amicable terms that were agreed. Uh, amongst other things, um, so a couple of headlines there, contribution of £1.1 million pounds by Dorset Council to BCP Council to uh, contribute towards exit costs that uh, BCP will uh, incur as a result of the dissolution of Stour Valley Pool Partnership and some potential risk around that. The cabinet paper itself uh, modelled recommendation, modelled savings of in excess of seven hundred thousand pounds per annum through Dorset Council in insourcing its own services. Um, so a short payback period for the one point one million costs there. There'll also be uh, a scaling back, which has been agreed in that uh, letter that I refer referred to, uh, scaling back of the contract payments from Dorset Council to uh, Stour Valley Pool Partnership during the course of this year as services transition from. SVPP into Dorset Council. Uh, page 179 is next steps and current steps. So um, the two councils and SVPP management team itself are working on, continue to work on a plan that has been outlined for services to transfer from SVPP to Dorset Council. Uh, as we said, there'll be a contract price reduction as services transfer. It makes sense that Dorset Council is incurring costs in uh, increasing its own in-house provision, it would scale back on the contract price it pays to SVPP uh, for services that are coming across. The aim initially for all of us is for all services to be transferred across to Dorset Council by the 1st of December. That allows us to go into our year-end and billing processes um, with a, a, um, a very clear um, disentanglement, for want of a better term, from uh, external arrangements. Um, and so that's the the, the date that we're aiming for, with a view that SVPP will then be formally wound up on the 31st of March, 2023. 
Dorset Council was currently recruiting to vacancies that it had been holding in its uh, establishment for quite some time. Uh, and then there will be a scaling up process for the additional 22 posts that were set out in the Cabinet report in December uh, to be uh, assimilated into the Revs and Bens team in Dorset Council. There's confirmation there that there is no tupi arrangement in place, but an HR protocol has been agreed so that when we are um, seeking to uh, increase our own staffing, um, posts will be advertised internally first. So when Dorset Council advertises posts, they'll be available for an internal cohort, which is um, the own, our own Revs and Bens team at Dorset Council and an element of the Stour Valley Hall partnership team as well. Um, so we protect against any potential redundancies where we can before we move to uh, advertising those vacancies externally. All of that will be reported to our portfolio holder, Councillor Suttle, and we'll go through to Place and Resources Scrutiny Committee. The ambition is um, by the time we've reached 1st of December, as I say, most of those trans all of those services is, um, is uh, our target to, to have transferred. Once we've done end of year in billing, by the time we move into um, mid to, to late April next year for our longer term trans transformation plans to begin. Um, and really the use of our strategic data resource uh, to help with longer term service design. Um, my final slide on page 180. Um, so what will all of that mean? Uh, well, it already means that all Dorset Council customers are dealt with on a single database. That's a piece of work that we'd uh, started early and had transitioned a huge amount of resource, effort, time and energy gone into that by uh, Dorset Council's own team, as well as support from SVPP uh, and from our external supplier, Capita. Uh, it will take some time to transition all services and customers across, but we've already started that, um, as I've set out. Um, communication process already started, so all the council tax and um, business rates bills that went out for 22, 23 made it clear it was Dorset Council. All posts, so um, customers that deal with us continue to deal with us by post, all of that will come here. Um, and customers are starting to be serviced by the Dorset Council team already, transitioning from uh, Stour Valley Hall Partnership. Our single database means the Dorset Council team can see all the workload and is already starting to pick up that customer service for customers in the east and north. Um, we're all ide already identifying any workload issues and planning um, much more easily from the single database than we were from fragmented, fragmented multiple databases that, that we had before. Uh, and as always, our aim to minimise disruption uh, to the customer, um, and we're hoping that many won't actually notice this has happened at all. That's the best outcome that we can hope for. Transition is smooth and seamless uh, into Dorset Council from SVPP for customers in the East and North. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Any questions from members? Councillor Biggs? Yeah, I suppose uh, your final remarks are very poignant. You know, at the end of the day, it's, it's what the customer notices. And if they don't notice anything, it's great. But I, I, I guess many members would have had a, um, a large email inbox filled with complaints regarding planning sort of IT changes, etc. And the, and the scars of, of trying to deal with those, I mean, it seems to be sorted now, but it was a rather painful process, uh, completely different, I appreciate, but it's an IT system, things will change, things will go wrong. Um, is there sort of backups and adequate support to deal with those potential problems? Um, because I'm sure we'll hear about them if it goes wrong, but if, we, if, if it goes well, we won't hear anything. And, uh, uh, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that the fact that you haven't heard anything is testament to the fact that the IT transition happened some some months ago. So we're we're over kind of initial um, initial issues. As I say a huge amount of effort went into that from colleagues in our own revenues and benefits services and in in um, Star Valley Hall Partnership. Um, all of that work geared towards a single single kind of customer portal for um, revs and bend services. So it's not to say things can't you know you can't have um, systems issues in future. There'll be disruption but it's one database for all five of our predecessor databases now. If there are no other questions, thank you, Jim, much appreciated. Members, we now move on to agenda item uh, number 11, which is the meeting arrangements and the health and wellbeing board, which is over to Jonathan Mayer. Thank you. Good morning, members. As I've not spoken for a while, I'll reintroduce myself for the benefit of anyone watching um, the meeting this morning. I'm Jonathan Mayer. I'm the Corporate Director for Legal and Democratic and the Council's Monitoring Officer. 
one of the roles of this committee is to make recommendations to the full council about uh, the council's constitution. And within the council's constitution, we have the arrangements uh, for, for meetings, the arrangements uh, for committees like this one and how you conduct your business. And Chairman, you said at the start of this meeting, I think it was two years and three months since you uh, held a meeting like this in, in person. And I think it is a welcome return to in-person meetings, but as, as I've commented in the report, uh, one size doesn't really fit everyone. And there are circumstances, settings, types of meetings uh, where it's appropriate to get together in a room like this. There are other instances where it's more appropriate, more efficient and effective um, to continue to meet online. And the Health and Wellbeing Board is, is an example of that. The Health and Wellbeing Board, um, legally, it is a committee of Dorset Council, uh, but it's like no other committee that I've ever come across. It has a um, membership of 18, um, only three of whom are members of this council. Um, the rest are representatives of various health bodies um, and officers of this council. And very unusually, it's a board on which officers um, have, have voting rights in the same way that you as councillors do. So it's quite, quite a, a strange, um, strange committee or, or board. Um, and so at the I've had a request from the chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board, Councillor Rebecca that th that board should continue to meet online. Now, we know that legally, um, to hold decision-making meetings, you have to meet in person in a room like this. Um, so the recommendation is that that board should meet informally online. And as happened following the end of the flexibility regulations d during the pandemic, um, that an officer uh, with delegated powers, in, in this case the Director of Public Health, Sam Crow, uh, should hear what members have to say informally in that meeting and should then have delegated powers to make decisions on, on behalf of the Health and Wellbeing Board. And that's a position, um, you'll notice that was being requested uh, by the Chair of that board. So that's specifically about the Health and Wellbeing Board. And then um, we know that uh, during during the pandemic after the end of the flexibility regulations, um, the chief executive exercised his delegated power in a case of a, an emergency to take uh, meetings of the council back online again, to meet informally. What, what I'm suggesting in this report is that in exceptional circumstances and after consulting uh, with the relevant committee chair, the chief executive should have the power on a case-by-case -case basis um, to convene informal online meetings, whether that's the full council, uh, the cabinet, um, or, or a committee of some sort, a meeting like this one. Um, and that should be um, in, in what are exceptional circumstances. Um, the Fire and Rescue Authority has adopted a very similar arrangement. Um, and I could foresee, for instance, if we had extreme weather conditions, you might wish to go ahead with a meeting, um, but a meeting at which, um, a meeting that's online and where an officer then makes a decision about the board. So Chairman, we've got um, four recommendations in the, in the report, the first three of which relate to the Health and Wellbeing Board, um, and uh, the fourth, which is in two parts, makes recommendations to enable the chief executive in, in the exceptional circumstances to take meetings online. Thank you, Jonathan. Any questions from members? Yes, Councillor Mike Parks. Thank, thank you, Chairman. I'd just like to make comment. I do understand yeah, the rationale behind um, some of this. Um, however, as we moved out of the pandemic, concern was raised by a number of um, members um, across the floor. Um, regarding the fact that we weren't having face-to-face -face meetings and um, the p potential perception of a lack of a democratic process. Um, so I just think if we 
go down this route, we need to exercise it with caution. Um, and perhaps we ought to put in a time limit on, on this rather than sort of this being ad infinitum that this board meets virtually. Um, but as a general rule, I, I personally won't be able to support this. Thank you, Councillor Parks. Jonathan, did you want to come back on that? Chairman, I, I, th I think, first of all, I think it's worth commenting that the this has come at the request of the, um, the Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board for that particular part of the recommendation. I think, I believe, after taking soundings um, from, the, from the rest of that board. Uh, but I, I would be, I would be very happy to um, bring a paper back to this um, this committee if you wanted to review the working arrangement, um, perhaps after a year. Uh, but at some, but at some suitable, um, some suitable interval, so that we could review how things were going, uh, how on how many occasions had it been necessary, exceptionally to meet on time? How are the health and well-being boards? What about that suggestion, Councillor Parks, that um, in essence we we um, take these uh, recommendations back, we have a review after a year. Is that something that you would then find acceptable? I'd, I'd find the year for the Health and Wellbeing Board, but I, I just don't feel generally we should be defaulting to having that ability to, to meet virtually rather than in person. Councillor Susan Coffin. Um, I actually have to disagree with Councillor Parks because I think the Health and Wellbeing Board, you know, you have a lot of, um, it's not just councillors, where, you know, these, these committees, a lot of the committees for councillor planning committees, and so a lot of them are councillors and officers who, who, are, who are used to going to in-person meetings. But my, my understanding of the Health and Wellbeing Board is it's a number of people attending from different areas in Dorset or maybe even further. So I think for um, that particular one, I would be happy to support that and in exceptional circumstances with the amendment from um, Jonathan Mayer. But I think in some circumstances, if, if it's pe people who attend those meetings who are not councillors or working for the council officers, I think sometimes we have to look at the bigger picture in this and what is, is best for committee members as well. So I would support it with um, Jonathan's amendment. Thank you, Councillor. Any other comments? Councillor Biggs. Yes, I, I absolutely support the, the, the changes for Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, I think members might be a bit surprised that with, with item four, which is about extending that to all committees, as, as I see it, full council, um, cabinet, um, I think members of the public will probably think, well, why not anyway? You know, I think you, most of you got used to working online and, and uh, I don't have a problem, but I, I, I think, you know, it, A says in exceptional circumstances. And I think I'll need some clarification what those, what do you mean by exceptional? Because if this starts to become a, it's all right until there's a decision that people disagree with and think, well, I'm sure we wouldn't made that and that's, that's and it gets very controversial and then we're into a really tricky situation. I hope we don't get in there, but I think members need to be minded. We're not just talking about health and wellbeing. We're talking about cabinet and full council, which is quite a serious change. I do support it, but I'd, I'd like that clarification and what you mean by exceptional circumstances, please. Yeah, Chair, Chairman, it's, it's difficult to define exceptional circumstances, isn't it? It's one of those ones, I'll, I'll know it when I see it. Um, or in this instance, the relevant chair, who, the relevant chairman who would be the decision maker on this, who would be deciding um, with the chief executive whether something is ex exceptional and warranted being taken online uh, would, would, would recognise it. The only one that is very obvious to me is around extreme weather conditions. Um, so co colleagues who work in schools have told me there will never ever be such a thing for them as a snow day again. Um, so um, teachers, teachers carry on teaching, don't they, no matter what the weather now. Um, we've learned that from the pandemic. So exceptional weather, 
uh, where otherwise you'd have to cancel a meeting altogether, but where the agenda lends itself to meeting online is, is the obvious one that I can think of. Any other questions or points, members? Councillor Mike Parks. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Sorry, sorry to come back. I'd, I'd be quite happy, you know, based on what Councillor Cockin said and, and some of the clarification from Jonathan um, around items one to three. Um, I am not comfortable with the lack of clarity over um, item four. Um, could we, when we go to a vote, take them items one to three and then item four as a separate item? Thank you. Yes, I was going to suggest to do um, exactly that by, by the feeling of um, the comments which have been made. Um, so, uh, Jonathan, as the one year was proposed by you, it's not a councillor amendment, so therefore we don't need to vote on the amendment. Is that correct? Yes. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Chairman, I, th I, th I think if there is general agreement um, that what, whatever, whatever, is, whatever happens this morning, if one, two, and three, for instance, were to go through, um, that would be subject to a one-year review. Uh, equally, if, if four went through as well, that would be subject to one-year review. I think you've got a consensus around that. Okay, then, members. So we will take this in two sections, and for the benefit of those members of the public or other councillors who might be listening in, I shall read out the... Yeah, I'll get on to that. So the recommendations uh, one, two, three. Uh, recommendation one is that the Health and Wellbeing Board should meet informally online as its usual way of doing business. Number two is that as a matter of course and for the duration of their appointment, the co-opted members of the Health and Wellbeing Board should be given dispensation for attending meetings in person. And three, that delegated authority be given to the Director of Public Health after consultation with the Health and Wellbeing Board at informal online meetings to make all decisions within the terms of the references of the Board and that would be reviewed after one year from today. Is that, Jonathan, if it's decided, the one year? Or, or the nearest? Yeah. Uh, do I have a proposer for that one, please? Seconded by Councillor Rod Adkins. All those in favour, put your hands, please. That's everybody. That's carried unanimously. Right, agenda, um, recommendation four, and again, I'll read that out for the members uh, or residents who may be listening online, is four, that the chief executive be given delegated authority under A, in exceptional circumstances and after consultation with the relevant chair to convene informal online meetings of the full council, the cabinet, or any committee or subcommittee, and B, after consulting members at informed online meetings to make any decisions taking into account the views expressed by members about the decision that they would be minded to make had it been possible to hold a formal decision-making meeting online. And again, that would be reviewed after one year. Do I have a proposer for that? Councillor Susan Cocking, do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Biggs. All those in favour, please raise your hands. It's one, two, three, four, five. All those against, one, and one abstention, which is myself. Thank you, members. Jonathan, um, is that something that uh, is being brought to the next full council? So, Chairman, what you've agreed this morning are recommendations to the next full council meeting. Oh, I get to speak at three council meetings in a row. I might even get a chair at the front at some point, you know. Um, right, thank you for that, members. Uh, moving on to agenda item 12, constitution update. Is there any updates, Jonathan? Yes, there's a, an update from me, Chairman. So the constitution, um, as we've learned in the previous item, uh, is usually only amended uh, by the full council. 
uh, by a decision at the full council meeting. There are those circumstances uh, where I can make changes to the constitution, um, things that are, for instance, con consequential changes uh, as a result of changes to the law. And I bring those um, changes to this committee uh, just for your information. One, of, uh, one part of the constitution is the council's policy framework and certain key policies are only agreed um, by the full council itself. Uh, and those sit alongside the constitution. One of those policies is the housing allocation policy. And uh, colleague, colleagues in um, adults and housing have had to make um, a series of consequential changes to the housing's allocation policy uh, because of the Ukrainian family scheme and the homes for the Ukraine scheme. And this is about uh, people not having to satisfy residency conditions in order to meet our housing al allocation policy. Obviously, these are refugees coming into the country uh, and being found homes in, in, in Dorset. In ordinary circumstances, those wouldn't satisfy our policy. Um, but because of the legal changes introduced um, nationally by government to, through the Ukrainian family scheme and the homes for the Ukraine scheme, we have to make consequential changes to our policy. Any questions from members on what Jonathan has just raised? And I presume that's just to note, Jonathan. That is just to note, Chairman. Thank you. We will now move on to agenda item 13, which is to note, uh, which is the minutes of the audit and governance subcommittee. Um, any questions from any members on that? No, nope, and that's just to note. Agenda item 14 is the forward plan. Um, obviously, um, several things have been mentioned during today's meeting, which either Mark Eyre or Aidan Dunn will be looking at bringing forward. They will obviously take um, those conversations with Susan Dallison and um, dates, times, etc. cetera, will, will be adjusted. But does any member of the committee have any comments? I'll take that as a no. Agenda item 15, urgent business. Agenda item 16, exempt business. There are neither of those. Um, I'll just make this point as I always do because I never make or take anything for granted as this is the last meeting of the calendar year for audit and governance. As chair, I'd like to thank all members for your attendance and participation and that too of all officers. Thank you very much. And I believe that is meeting finished at 11.50. Thank you all very much.